Hello everyone and thanks for watching Edupedia World Videos. In this video, we begin our study of the basic structure of the atom as a whole and that eventually will lead us to the Bohr model. Now, one of the first hypotheses of the structure of the atom which needed to explain why the electrons are moving but the positively charged particles are not moving and there had to be positively charged particles because atoms as a whole were electrically neutral was the Thomson model of the atom. It is also sometimes referred to as the plum pudding model. And this model basically said that atoms are spherically charged objects which have positive charge distributed throughout them. So this whole material would be positively charged. And then you have small packets. I just, I made a mess of this figure, sorry. So this hole was positively charged and then you had small negatively charged particles embedded inside this positively charged material. So it would be like if you had some pudding and there were some plums in some small places and that's why it's called the plum pudding model. So whenever we ionize them, uh, the small negatively charged particles detached easily because they were added on top of the atoms but the rest of the material which was all positively charged stays as it was because its mass was high. This was accepted for some time, but then there was a scientist, Rutherford, who did an experiment, and with that experiment, he was able to debunk Thomson's model, and then he created his own model, which was called the Rutherford model of the atom. So let's look at Rutherford's experiment first. He took a very thin foil of gold, an extremely thin, which had maybe a thickness of a few atomic layers, and he just through alpha particles at this thin foil. Alpha particles are a 4He2 nucleus. Basically, it is a combination of two protons and two neutrons without electrons. That's why I call it a 4He2 nucleus, not helium. If you take the two electrons out of the helium, what you're left with is the nucleus, and that nucleus is called alpha particle. And he just bombarded a stream of alpha particles on this thin foil and the results he found out were that most of the alpha particles pass through this foil undeviated. So, for example, this alpha particle might have gone like this, this alpha particle might have gone like this. Then there were a few alpha particles which were deviated slightly. So this alpha particle may have gone like this, this alpha particle may be like this. And there were a very few number which were deviated by a very large amount. That number was roughly 1 in 8,000. So 1 in 8,000 alpha particles, a very, very small number of them, were actually deviated by a very large amount. So they might go to the gold foil and come back like this. Or they might, in fact, even just come back along the direction they went through. So most of the alpha particles passed through undeviated. A small amount deviated a little bit and there was a very very tiny amount of alpha particles roughly 1 in 8000 which were deviated by let's say more than 180 degrees which were deviated by a large amount. This was inconsistent with Thomson's model because according to Thomson's model the atom was completely covered with positively charged material and electrons were embedded into it and in that case all of the alpha particles which were themselves positively charged because we remove the electrons from them, all the alpha particles would have been deviated by huge amounts because they would have been repelled by the positively charged material of the atom as a whole. But most of the alpha particles pass through undeviated, but a very small amount was deviated. From that he drew the conclusion that there must be very small positively charged particles and there must be electrons moving around them and most of the atom would have been empty space. And he also postulated that the nucleus or the positively charged material which was at the center, not only did it have a volume much much smaller than the volume of the atom, but it has a mass much much greater than the mass of the electron. So this was Rutherford's model in which you had positively charged, at that time uh, he just assumed they were just positively charged particles, but later we found out there were some neutral particles as well called neutrons, we will not focus on them right now. He assumed that they were very heavy positively charged particles which were also occupied a very small volume and they were light negatively charged particles which were orbiting 
around these nuclei. This, in contrast with Thomson's plum pudding model, assumed that the whole material was positively charged and there were negatively charged small pieces of electrons embedded inside. This assumed that most of the atom was empty space. In fact, around 99.99% of the atom is empty space. Uh, there is a positively charged nucleus at the center which occupies a very small volume but is very heavy. And the electrons are light and they move around it. This explained a lot of phenomena. This explained why most of the uh, alpha particles passed through undeviated because most of the atom was empty space. Why some of them were deviated by a decent amount and why 1 in 8000, a very few amount, were deviated by large angles. That was because they strike very close to the nucleus and the nucleus itself was positively charged. Also, it explained why when we see current flowing through in a discharge tube, like we saw in the last video, uh, we, do, we only see the negatively charged particles flowing. We don't really see the positively charged particles. And that's because positively charged particles are very heavy compared to the negatively charged particles. Now we know that the mass of a proton is roughly 1850 times the mass of the electron. So, protons are much much heavier than the electrons. Now, this was a good enough model and it was accepted for a while, but it had some problems. One of the problems it has was, according to Maxwell's theory of electromagnetic radiation, accelerating charged particles continuously radiate energy. And if electrons continuously radiated energy, then they would not orbit the nucleus always. They would spiral inside and inside and eventually just come down and strike the nucleus. The radius would keep on decreasing. And if you did the math, this would probably happen in a very, very small time of the order of nanoseconds. However, electrons tend to move around the nucleus. If it's a stable atom, they can do that forever without changing. And that wasn't able to be explained by uh, Rutherford because Maxwell's law stated that accelerating particles always radiated energy. So that was, in a weird way, that was fixed by Bohr. It was not really fixed by Bohr because he use some postulates which basically assume that in certain orbits Maxwell's laws were not valid. However, later on when we discovered quantum mechanics, we were able to explain all those phenomena. So Bohr had the correct idea, but his explanation was not really correct. In fact, he did not really give an explanation. So to study the Bohr's model of the atom, we start with Bohr's postulates. Postulates in any theory are things which you assume to be true and you don't give any evidence for them to be true. You say these things are true and if these things are true, then we are able to explain every other phenomena using logic and rationality. But postulates themselves do not need to be proved. So first postulate was electrons revolve around the nucleus in circular orbits. I'm sorry. In circular orbits. This was taken from Rutherford's model because Rutherford basically assumed that, that there was a small nucleus which had a very tiny volume but a very heavy mass and electrons were light and they revolved around it in circular orbits. The second one, these orbits can take special values of radius in which electrons do not radiate energy. Now he assumed this but he did not really prove this, he took it as a postulate. Later on we were able to prove it using quantum mechanics but that is not in your course. Right now he just assumed that the problem with Rutherford's model was that Maxwell's equations predicted that electrons would radiate energy and eventually strike the nucleus. He said that there were some special orbits in which this was not true. Most orbits this would be true, but some special orbits in which the electrons would not radiate energy. And he called these orbits stationary orbits. The third postulate was the energy of an atom has a fixed value 
in a given stationary orbit. So every orbit would have its own energy and different orbits would have different energies. The final rule which is the most important postulate which in a way sort of a, uh, backed up the second postulate is known as Bohr's quantization rule. And that basically said that the angular momentum in stationary orbits is an integral multiple of a constant h by 2 pi. h was already there because Planck had already named this constant to try to explain some black body radiation and so he assumed that the angular momentum in stationary orbits is either h by 2 pi or 4 h by 2 pi or 6 h by 2 pi. It is always an integral multiple of h by 2 pi and this is where quantization comes from. Quantization basically means that things come in discrete packets. They come in what is called quantas. So these are the four postulates which he assumed and he was able to predict quite accurately the behavior of some ions based on this. The one major limitation of Bohr's quantization uh, of Bohr's model was that it only worked for hydrogen like ions. In other words, it worked for atoms in which there was a nucleus and there was one electron and only one electron revolving around it. So you could have a hydrogen atom in which there was a proton and an electron around it. You could have a helium plus atom in which there was uh, two protons and two neutrons but only one electron revolving around it because we took out one electron. Or lithium plus plus or beryllium plus plus plus. These are called hydrogen-like ions because they only have one electron revolving around the nucleus. So Bohr's model accurately predicted a lot of results for these uh, these type of ions. So let's let's now get into the mathematics of Bohr's model and see the results which he actually predicted. So we'll not just do it for a hydrogen atom, we'll do it for all hydrogen-like ions. So the general model for a hydrogen-like ion would be Z, Z is the atomic number, number of protons or number of electrons if it were a neutral atom. There would be Z protons, might be some neutrons as well but they don't have any charge so they don't matter and there's one electron revolving around it. So the electron has a charge 1E and the charge of the nucleus is ZE. So if it's a helium ion then the charge of the nucleus would be 2E because there would be two, uh, two protons in there. right? So and this is positive, this is negative, that's obviously understood. And the electron is revolving in this orbit, let's say the electron has a speed v and the radius is r. Now using Newton's laws we can see that the force between these two which would be the force due to attraction by Coulomb's law has to equal the centripetal force because that is what causes circular motion. So the equation would be z e times e times 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught q1 q2 by r squared is equal to mv squared by r. This is the first equation. Now the second equation comes from Bohr's quantization rule which says that the angular momentum of this electron which can be written as mvr has to be an integral multiple of h by 2 pi. So we can take it to be nh by 2 pi. These and only these two equations completely determine the properties of any hydrogen like ion. Now you can simplify these two, I'm not going to do it, I'll leave it for you to do it at home and the final results you'll get are R is equal to epsilon naught h square by pi m e squared into n squared by z and v is equal to e squared by 2 epsilon naught h into z by n. Now you don't need to remember these two formulas, I've never tried to remember them, I just remember or understand these two equations and I'm able to derive them if I ever need them. What you do need to remember are these dependences. 
So what you need to remember is the radius goes like n squared by z and the speed or the velocity goes like z by n. The rest of the constants you don't need to worry about. So let me just write all these things properly now. Uh, the radius is a constant which is equal to epsilon naught h square by pi m e square. Don't need to remember that times n squared by z. The speed is equal to e square by 2 epsilon naught h. Again, don't need to remember this times z by n. So for the same value of n, that means for the same quantized orbit, every orbit has its own value of n. Remember that for the same value of n, the larger the mass, the greater the velocity. So for example, the helium ion, uh, the electron in the helium ion would have twice the velocity that the electron in the hydrogen ion would have because z for a helium ion is 2 and for a hydrogen ion is 1. Right. Next, the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is just half mv squared and that will come out to be again you don't need to remember the main part m e to the power 4 by 8 epsilon naught square h square multiplied by z square by m square this is the important part kinetic energy goes as z square by n square what is the potential energy the potential energy will be minus k q 1 q 2 by r or minus 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught z e times e by r you can put the value of r from here and what you'll get is minus m e to the power 4 by 4 epsilon naught square h squared into z squared by n squared. So both the energies go as z squared by n squared. And finally, the total kinetic energy, which would be the kinetic energy plus potential energy, the total energy that would be equal to minus m e to the power 4 by 8 epsilon naught squared h squared into z squared by n squared. Again, I'll emphasize, you don't need to remember what's in the bracket. What is important in, is you need to remember these dependencies on z and n. Because n will be different for different orbits, z will be different for different ions. e, epsilon naught, h, all these are constants. They have a particular value. Right. So this is the fundamental victory of Bohr's model that it was able to determine the radius, the velocity and the energies of all the electrons in all the ions. Now one important thing, the moment we say Ep is equal to minus 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught ZE into E by R, that means we've assumed that the potential energy is 0 at R is equal to infinity. Right. That is generally the case we consider in electrodynamics that the potential energy is zero when the ions are widely separated. So some some things which you probably need to remember after this are if you take this then this particular quantity comes out to be 0 0.529 angstrom. One angstrom is 10 to the power minus 10 meters. So 0 0.529 angstrom into n squared by z or this is called A a into n squared by z right and a sometimes is also called a naught that's actually a better name and this is called the Bohr radius and its value is 0 0.529 angstrom right now this tells us something important let's assume z is equal to 1 for now let's assume a hydrogen ion a hydrogen atom so for hydrogen atom in which you have a proton and you have an electron around it and the electron can move in any number of infinite orbits. It can move in an orbit in which n is equal to 1, 2, 3, 5 or 10. If it moves in an orbit where n is equal to 1, then the radius is a naught. If it moves in an orbit where n is equal to 2, then the radius will be 4 a naught. Because it depends on n squared. If the radius, if n is equal to 3, that is the third orbit, then the radius would be 9 a naught. Similarly, instead of a hydrogen ion, if it was a helium ion, then the radius of the first orbit would not be a naught. It would be a naught by two because z is two. Of the second one, would not be four a naught. It would be four a naught by two. Right. So a naught into n squared by z is the radius of any orbit. N tells us which orbit is it. It is the first orbit, the second orbit, the third orbit, and z is the um, atomic number or the number of protons n is also called for any orbit n is called the principal 
quantum number. We won't go into quantum mechanics in this course, but these names are important, so you should remember this is the principal quantum number. And all these things, R, V, E, K, these are sometimes referred to as the nth orbit, but most likely they're referred to as the nth energy state. So for example, you might get a question that what is the radius of the orbit of the electron in the third energy state in a helium ion? So that would be 9A0 by 2 because third energy state means N is equal to 3 and it's a helium ion so Z will be equal to 2. So that would be 9A0 by 2. Another thing you need to remember just like this is equal to 0.5 to 9 angstrom, this whole term is equal to 13.6 electron volts. That means the energy, total energy and this is where things get interesting and really agree with the experiment so that we know we're going on the right track. The total energy is minus 13.6 electron volts multiplied by z squared by n squared. I'm sorry. This tells us the energy of n the nth orbit. Now the reason this is so important is because even before Bohr model we knew something about hydrogen which was referred to as the spectrum of hydrogen. Now every atom, every molecule, every material has a spectrum. A spectrum is basically the range of wavelengths of frequencies of light that is either emitted or absorbed. There is an absorption spectrum, there is an emission spectrum. Right now we are concerned with what light is emitted. So even before Bohr's model, we knew that hydrogen emits light of very specific wavelengths. It does not just emit light of wavelength between one particular range and another particular range. It always emits light of specific wavelengths. And if we were to assume that the Bohr's model was correct, then let's say there was an electron and that electron was in the third energy state and from the third energy state it went down to the second energy state. In that case, its energy would go from minus 13.6. This is negative by the way because this is a bound system, right? So in a bound system, the total energy is negative. So 13.6 into 1 by 3 squared. This was the energy earlier and now the energy is minus 13.6 into 1 by 2 squared. Right. So the change in these two energies will be the change in energy of the electron and that is the energy of the photon that is emitted in this transition. So when an electron in a hydrogen atom goes from the third energy state to the second energy state, it emits a photon such that hc by lambda, the energy of that photon, will be 13.6 into 1 by 2 squared minus 1 by 3 squared. And in fact, if we look at the wavelength emitted by hydrogen atom, it was always of this form. It was either 13.6 times 1 by 2 squared minus 1 by 3 squared or 13.6 times 1 by 6 squared minus 1 by 7 squared which would mean it's going from n is equal to 7 to n is equal to 6. So this particular formula was already known. The formula which I'm talking about was known as the Rydberg formula and it was 1 by lambda is equal to r z square 1 by n square minus 1 by m square. Now we didn't know initially what n or m was just experimentalists had seen the spectrum of hydrogen and spectrum of hydrogen like ions and they were able to experimentally deduce this formula that the inverse of the lambda always is of this form where n and m are two numbers. The greatest victory of Bohr model was that he was able to predict this very same formula using his Bohr's quantization rule because he was able to prove that the energy is proportional to z squared by n squared where n is the energy state, first, second, third, fourth energy state. Before that, these were just numbers, but now we realize that whenever we have n is equal to 2 and m is equal to 3, that means the photon is emitted because the electron moves from the third energy state to the second energy state. If it goes from the second to the third energy state, it will absorb a photon. So not only does hydrogen emit light of specific wavelengths, it also absorbs light of specific wavelengths. Let's look at this formula a little bit further. Equal to R z squared times 1 by n squared minus 1 by m squared 
This was the formula which was there before Bohr's postulates, but only from an experimental point of view. And R had the value equal to 1.0973 into 10 to the power 7 per meter, and it was called the Rydberg constant. And so this was experimentally determined. And if you actually take HC by lambda is equal to 13.7 into this, then R has the value of 13.6 electron volts divided by HC. And that actually comes out to be this particular number. So this was the greatest victory of Bohr's model, that there was a formula for the spectrum of hydrogen atom and hydrogen-like ions, which we had guessed before. We just said that it will always be of this form where n and m are two integers. But now Bohr stated that these two integers are the two energy levels. Light is emitted when you come down in energy. Light is absorbed when you go up in energy. Now, because this so formula and this spectrum existed way before Bohr's rule, different forms of this equation were given, given different names in honor of the scientists who discovered them. So there was the Lyman series. The Lyman series basically said that n is equal to 1 and m is greater than 1. Basically, anything from the first energy state to any energy state, going from 3 to 1, from 2 to 1, from 1 to 4, from 1 to 7, they all fall under the Lyman series. These were a series of wavelengths. Then there was the Balmer series, in which n was 2 and m was greater than 2. So 2 to 5, 5 to 2, 2 to 7, 3 to 2, all these wavelengths would be considered under the Balmer series. Then there was the Paschen series. This actually goes on uh, for a bit, but you just need to know these three. And that was n is equal to 3 and m was greater than 3. Right. So, for example, if uh, light went from n is equal to 7 to n is equal to 2, then the wavelength of that light would fall in the Balmer series. Because anything from n is equal to 2 would be Balmer series. 2 to 1 would not be Balmer, it would be Lyman. Right. Now, this, the wavelength, uh, you can try this at home by actually taking the numbers. The wavelength, the value of the wavelength, when n was 1, and m was something between 2 and infinity, the wavelength always lies in the ultraviolet region. The wavelength for the Balmer series lies in the visible region. And this is why occasionally you see a particular color in the spectrum of light, occasion in the spectrum of gases. Gases specifically will a lot, a lot of times emit light of a particular color. That's because there are discrete energy levels and they emit light of particular wavelengths. And the Paschen series lies in the infrared region. So now the next step is to learn some terms which are generally used in connection with Bohr's model. So just a brief recap of everything we've learned now. There are uh, there's a proton. There are many protons. Let's just say Z E Z is one uh, for hydrogen, and they can be many different energy states. These should be perfect circles. I apologize for that, but they can be many different energy states. If an electron is going from this state to this state, it will absorb some energy. If this is n is equal to 2 and n is equal to 3, then it will absorb the energy which will be equal to 13.6 electron volts times 1 by 2 squared minus 1 by 3 squared. Because 13.6 by 1 by 2 squared is the energy here, 13.6 into 1 by 3 squared is the energy here. So the difference in these two energies will be the energy needed for it to transition. So, and these are different energy levels which go on to infinity. The first term we need to know is the ionization energy. Uh, by the way, before that, let's just look at some values so that we can quickly understand these levels. N is equal to 1 is 13.6 electron volts. N is equal to 2 is 13.6 by 4 or 3.4 electron volts. N is equal to 3 is 13.6 by 9 which is around 1.5 electron volts. So this is N equal to 1, 2, 3. This difference is roughly 10.2 electron volts. This difference is roughly 1.9 electron volts. 
right so when um, an electron goes from energy level 2 to energy level 3 it will either absorb um, a photon of energy 1.9 electron volts or if it comes down from energy 3 to energy 2 it will emit a photon of energy 1.9 electron volts and every energy for a photon corresponds to a specific wavelength right so the ionization energy is defined as the minimum energy needed to ionize the atom right now I'm going to use a lot of terms ionization energy binding energy excitation energy these have specific meanings so I want you to pay attention to the definition of each of them ionization energy is the minimum energy needed to ionize an atom ionize means take the atom from what state it is in to infinity so if the atom is in this state if the electron is in this state I'll use the words interchangeably electron is in first energy state or atom is in first energy state if the atom is in first energy state then the ionization energy is 13.6 electron volts because it needs 13.6 electron volts to completely break apart to go to the infinite energy level if you will but if it is in the second state then the ionization energy is 3.4 electron volts if it is in the third state then all you need to do is give it 1.5 electron volts of energy for it to go up by the way these actually all are negative right because it is bound so if it is in the third state it has an energy of minus 1.5 electron volts because it is bound if it had an energy of zero electrons volts it would not be bound anymore and so if we give it one point electron volts it will be free then there is ionization potential ionization potential is nothing but the minimum potential to which an electron should be accelerated to get this energy now we use ionization potential uh, again and again because it's much easier to measure potential than it is to measure energy so for an atom in the second energy state if the ionization energy is 3.4 electron volts then the ionization potential is 3.4 volts okay it's as simple as that in this state if the ionization energy is 1.5 electron volts then the ionization potential is uh, 1.5 volts right so for a hydrogen atom in ground state ionization energy is 13.6 electron volts ground state means n is equal to 1 then there is a term called binding energy now binding energy is the energy that is released when these constituents are brought up from infinity to form the system in other words the energy that needs to be given to a system to break it apart again for an electron uh, for a hydrogen atom in the ground state the binding energy will be 13.6 electron volt and the binding potential will be 13.6 volts then there's a term that's called the excitation energy now both binding energy and ionization energy for any state involves taking an electron from that state to infinity excitation energy is the energy needed to take an electron from that state to the next higher state so if an atom for hydrogen if an electron is in the first energy state then its excitation energy will be 10.2 electron volts because you need to give it 10.2 electron volts to make it go to the second energy state right so for in ground state ionization energy will be 13.6 electron volts but excitation energy will be 10.2 electron volts excitation energy is the energy needed to take the atom from the ground state to this state okay and the excitation potential is the potential that an electron must be accelerated through to get this energy so the excitation potential will be 10.2 volts uh, we'll continue discussion of Bohr's model in the next video thank you